And here, these numbers reflect is mostly a uh, working capital, okay? So if we see the numbers by the IFC, the International Finance Corporation, world of, part of the World Bank Group, uh, they consider that this gap is 5.2. Now, also important is that in the left-hand side, they are considering micro in this study. So in that study, they say 5.2 million, a trillion. In the right-hand side, we see that the, the number for 2020 is 1.7 um, trillion. And uh, it is important to um, take into account that in this study, they only included uh, SMEs, not micro. And that the respondents of this study were mostly uh, banks with, um, uh, let's say, the, the international ability to provide trade finance services. Now, the other question will be, well, what is trade finance? So trade finance in a specific or for going deep down from financing to uh, trade finance, trade finance is the set of different uh, different finance uh, financial instruments and products in order to finance both export and import activities. Within those instruments, we can we can talk about uh, letters of credit, guarantee, documentary collections, uh, and then we, we extend that a little bit more and we include a supply chain or cash management. We can be talking about the umbrella of a transaction banking products, as some call it, or also a working capital solutions. That's for having a, a distinction. So basically, in the left side, we can see both domestic and international integrating micro and SMEs. And on the right hand side, we can see mostly SMEs. And we're talking from an international perspective. So import and export. Now, the, the size of the problem in terms of the number of MSMEs that is affecting is uh, quite large. Um, so it's not only a numbers uh, problem in terms of dollars of 5.2 or 1.7 trillion, but it's also the number of MSMEs that is impacting, which is the 41% of them. If we consider in this study that is uh, across 128 countries, uh, 128 developing countries. So it is... Um, not only a problem that is mostly affecting a small, medium size and micro enterprises, but it is also affecting uh, those that are located in developing countries. Now, this is a big issue because the lack of financing or the lack of working capital financing, financing basically uh, inhibits uh, the ability of these type of enterprises to grow because they are trying to, uh, with their own resources, uh, in some cases, uh, or with resources that are not necessarily formal, but for example, chart loans, uh, finance their activities, right? That their day-to-day -day activities, instead of, for example, investing in their productivity and of course their long-term growth. So this is a, a key issue that is uh, important to tackle. And um, maybe we need to consider those two perspectives also, which is the, let's say the economical one uh, and the employment one. So from an economical perspective, uh, MSMEs per se don't necessarily represent uh, most of the economic production or GDP, but it is important to consider that they do provide a high uh, amount of jobs and uh, collaborating uh, to these enterprises in, in providing them access to financing will have an impact, of course, in, in local communities and the quality of life of these uh, communities. From a geographical perspective, basically, um, um, we can see here that uh, the gap is more uh, accentuated in some uh, countries than in others, that um, it is anyway throughout the world. And uh, also it is important to mention that uh, different countries have different strategies, of course, for tackling the gap. We can uh, go into detail later on in terms of regulation or advancement of uh, fintech ecosystems and so on. I would like just to, to finish by saying that there are some uh, key uh, causes of this gap that uh, could be maybe solved uh, hopefully by technology and that we're seeing already some cases of this. So some aspects uh, or some reasons banks or financial institutions uh, cannot or are currently not providing the entire uh, supply of financing to these uh, segments is because uh, they consider that it's um, very complex first of all, and also um, expensive to uh, generate, uh, let's say, the information or to achieve the level of information required for producing the uh, measurement of risk 
that uh, these entities or these companies have. Uh, so let's say the unit of cost for uh, measuring the risk is, of course, basically equal to the one of checking a large enterprise. So from a profitable perspective, it, it is not so um, easy to achieve um, profitability in at a scale. That it will be one other important one is the, of course, the high transaction cost or on with a with a low fee income, and uh, also important to to take into account that cap, uh, financial institutions that are regulated have uh, regulatory requirements uh, according to the Basel um, agreement. So that is other constraints. So they cannot, um, let's say, from the entire pie of assets, they cannot allocate. Uh, so many of them into a risky uh, into risky profiles. So this among uh, other um, reasons. Now I have um, I didn't mention, for example, COVID uh, in this case, and it's intentionally because um, the the financial gap is not a problem of the last uh, two years, or is, it was not caused by the by the COVID crisis. It was accentuated by it. Okay but it, it has come from before. So uh, in my perspective, it's basically uh, really important to focus on the on the roots of the problem and not to focus on, on something that, yeah, it is important and accentuated the problem, but it's not the, the root case of it. With that, I can close the presentation. I'm happy to take questions. Does anyone have Does any anyone questions? Have any before we, Before we move to the mirror, oh, need some echo. I'm gonna mute myself. No, it's okay. You should be able to talk if you know. The echo should be gone now. I need the so responsible for the echo. Oh, thank you. I, I added a few other other number as well, saying that basically in the U.S. So that's the only market I know about that SME represent 44 percent of the GDP. And they also present 99.9% .9 of all the companies in the, in the in the US. So they are like the major representatives of the company, and they represent 47.1% of the employee. So every time we think about employee, we think about like the Amazon of the world and everything. But SME represent like half of the task force. So they are a big, big, big market that need to be tackled. Thanks yes. for that context. That was fantastic. Just to get an idea of exactly how big a problem this is really. Um, for this problem, we are not scoping this out to any specific geography. Is that correct? We are talking generally at the moment and we will then eventually get down to broad ideas that are generic, not specific to any one region. So now yes. to tackle what we have going back to the mural, right? So we had a sentence in there and I'd like to unpack that bit by bit. So we said here, how can we make it attractive or affordable for liquidity providers to find and finance working capital needs? So that's one part of the sentence, right? And then needs of the formal small companies. So this is the category that we just spend some time understanding. Um, with rapid, easy access and competitive source of financing. So there are two Two personas here. There's the liquidity providers and then their customers who are these small companies. Now, the question that I have for you, and I guess it's an open question to everyone, really. So should we so if you zoom into the board and the sort of sticky notes right under that? I'm trying to structure this in terms of, you know, we we are financial. So when, when we start the sentence such as, how can we make it attractive? Who are the people that we're talking about? I know that we have a de facto team here. So the question is, uh, when we say we, is it Finastra de facto together that we're going to think about how do we solve this? Should we think of you as partners in this sort of framework? Or should we think of you as a potential intermediary between ourselves and the liquidity providers? Or would you be acting as one of the liquidity providers as well? So that's an open question right now. We don't have to answer it. We are thinking about sort of the value chain here, right? Um, and who does what in that value chain? 
because if you look at it and let me summon everyone so that everyone's looking at this section here. So we have us, that's Vinasha. We have potentially de facto who's here, who we may partner with or who may be acting as the second player here, the persona who are who we are bucketing as a liquidity provider, who in turn are solving for the small companies who are struggling to access financing. So this is sort of the value chain and we have to identify exactly <laughs> what the story is going to play out. So just, you know, raising that point here and uh, keen to hear your thoughts. I, I, I Let's say I will start by providing maybe a couple of examples of how in different geographies they have approached the problems from different angles. And maybe this can, uh, let's say, spur creativity on, on how we could uh, tackle this. So let's go to the example of, of Malaysia. OK, so Malaysia, they um, basically the government um, created um, a website in which there is, uh, they provide the guarantees from a government development bank. So those guarantees, the guarantees it serves as collateral, which is, uh, let's say, for diminishing risk of the different uh, financial offerings that can be um, financial institutions, can be fintechs, uh, and so on, offered to MSMEs, okay? So MSMEs in one single, state provided website can see the products that they can access and they will and, and that will be collateralized by the uh, state or the, this development bank by the state so basically in by doing this um one they are doing a couple of things the first one is that they are centralizing the offerings of the financial of the of the suppliers of financing in one single place will already diminish the cost of searching from the msmes the second one is that they are um, let's say collateralizing it, which is uh, a diminishing in the aspect of risk. Um, so let's say these type of solutions are, are taking pace. This will be simply one example of the case of Malaysia. Um, maybe other example is, is through the case of crowdsourcing. Um, that is, um, for example, in Chile, the Alejandro, maybe you can help me here. The name of the company in Chile is um, Fivana. Yeah, yeah. So basically, for example, in Chile, uh, it is important to mention that they already count with uh, an e-invoice repository, which is part of a global trend in regulation. So several countries, I mean, many in South America, but also in Southeast Asia, are adopting this uh, invoice repository in Europe as well. Um, and this basically uh, allows to uh, the invoices, which actually it is uh, uh, working capital that is blocked. You know, uh, MSMEs are waiting to for receiving the money against their invoices, and that working capital is blocked for one month or maybe two. So uh, that part of the infrastructure, if the government is is already, um, let's say, uh, having it in place, then they are uh, providing the opportunity for setting up different business models from the fintech sector that can, uh, for example, be a supply chain financing access information about those assets. So as there is risk assessment from a customer perspective, there is also risk assessment from a transaction perspective in this case via the invoices because they can retrieve information about the buyer, the supplier, who is paying, when is paying, and so on and so far. So this is what, what provides at the end of the day is information. And in, in that way, so business models can be created. And of course, in Chile is the case and alternative sources of financing are gaining pace when compared uh, with the uh, traditional sources of financing or the, the, the incumbents, let's say, in the space. This is happening in Chile, this is happening in Mexico, that they also have um, uh, e invoice repository. And yeah. maybe I talk too much about LATAM because I, is, I have been doing the, the studies in that region of the world lately. But yeah, there are examples throughout the world. Excellent, thank you. That's really helpful. Great example. Yeah. So coming I, back, I think, yeah, I, so, I think I think it's important to add uh, something, and it's and, and it's, it's just uh, kind of reiterating what what Miguel is saying. 
the problem the problem that we have in the trade finance space is not in, in, in regards to digitization of the process or efficiencies or to gain efficiency in the process that, that realistically is not the issue the issue that we have here is that the system as it is right now is not inclusive so even though if you automate and you make your system more efficient you're still living outside the the coverage all the people that are realistically needing the most that uh, is liquidity right so from that sense, like one of the components that we need to understand is how a risk is assessed and mitigated yeah. in the current situation, right? Right. Because if you're bringing different solutions in that way, as Miguel just explained, like it's data-driven, uh, data-driven uh, systems that are, are having a completely different methodology that like just goes out out of the traditional spectrum. So in that case, you're going to be able to just have a more inclusive system. You're going to be able to cover more people, right? I think that's kind of where you should be probably focusing on. And I'll explain why. Because even though you have liquidity and access to liquidity, if you are assessing risk exactly the same way that you were doing it before, you're not covering people anyway, right? So one component is liquidity. Right, and how their liquidity is a bit more flexible than another, right? And the other one is how you assess risk and how non traditional liquidity will allow you to explore different paths and different ways to be more inclusive, right? Why I'm saying this because at the moment a lot of the um, assessment when the funds are placed, right, for these financial systems are just uh, basically a cookie cutter. And that cookie only covers X amount of people. So we need to just kind of get out of there and create some more data driven systems that are going to allow us just to have a more holistic risk assessment. Right? I think there's also things that shouldn't be forgotten is, uh, is around regulatory and uh, the cost of actually financing, right? So one of the issues that you have, say, in Chile is that you've got withholding tax issues. So the cost of financing is is higher in certain countries and the ability to get money in and out is actually for investors is is not so easy let's say brazil would be a, a typical example with the movement of currencies etc so there's a lot of hedging that needs to take place so there's there's all of that as well i think you have to layer on top okay i'm gonna add my two cents to the to the, the mix here i also think that there is a, the reason why there is a lot of talk around latin america is because there is a readiness in the market in latin america that there is not in other parts of the world um if you think about um, for example, in Colombia, uh, it's very common to go and to play with virtual wallet or to have like this kind of non-bank or non-traditional banking way of exchanging money that is not necessarily well accepted in other places of the world. And um, there is also the system of crowdfunding in Latin America that's very big. Uh, if you think about small loan funding that's done by crowdfunding is much bigger than on the rest uh, on the other side of the world. So people are willing and they really believe that this is the best way to function than going via a centralized system. So I strongly believe in decentralization and it's, it's, I'm not sure if it's a cultural thing or not, but I know that it's already well versed uh, in, in Latin America. Okay. I mean, I, I think what, what Pierre is mentioning is also relevant in, in relation to something that Alejandro was mentioning yesterday, which is, I mean, we can talk about the, let's say, the the, the supply of, of financing to these segments, but also this is about the investment aspect, which is, um, uh, Alejandro, if I'm not wrong, you mentioned something like democrat, democratizing investment, something like it yesterday. Yeah, that's correct. Like, uh, and that's, that's one of the really most, or like the most powerful component out of DeFi, right? That you are democratizing the investment, meaning that I don't need a, a third party, I don't need an intermediary to just tell me where do I want to place my money. That, that currently is the is the case, right? So we have uh, these investor investment managers that are just telling you, look, put your money here, put your money there. But with DeFi, if you have the chance to, if you have five thousand dollars or you have one thousand dollars, you are able actually just to pull the funds whatever you believe uh, and uh, that's that's something that is extremely powerful right because before that investment was done by few right so I have, I'm sorry for interjecting here so there are a few sort of themes emerging right so here we've talked about the large problem as we've stated originally up here where we are talking about how do we make it attractive and affordable for liquidity providers right 
So if the liquidity provider is still in play, so the solution that we're offering, is it meant to be enabling that particular unit? Or should we think about alternatives to existing forms of liquidity provide providers that exist? Because that's two different approaches. So yeah. which of these is what what do we want to focus on today? Well, it's a great question. Like I personally, I, I would like I would like to see alternative uh, financial models, right? That's that's what I would like to see. Look, as a, as an overall solution, I understand and and and, and I'm sure that in the medium term, uh, traditional financial institutions are going to be part of how yeah. this is going to be closed, right? Like uh, believing that DeFi is going to be solely taking the whole effort to just close this gap is just ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. It's way too big, right? So yeah. a, a combination of both parties is, is needed. But if you ask me at the moment, what would be interesting to see? Why yeah. you're seeing these revolutionizing ideas that are going yeah. to allow us to just decrease barriers of entry, right? Yeah. Yeah, uh, and and uh, just cover a, a bigger spectrum of the of the society, right? The people that realistically need the service. All right, all right. So let's reorient then what the original yes. statement. Yes. Is. One to mention, one to mention, which is because there, there, what Alejandro is saying, I understand it, and I agree that uh, it is not going to be only the five, but it is it's going to be the five plus established financial institutions uh, reaching that segment by allowing them to reach that segment by facilitating that. Now, I think it is important also to kind of clarify until where do we want to go with DeFi? So, for example, is it are we going to treat DeFi and uh, as a last mile and delivery of um, um, liquidity or until the distributor point? So, mm. for, because probably basically a distributor of the, the one that is basically reaching the final customer doesn't have to be uh, the five percent, um, but they are receiving some part of the of the or the, the sourcing of the financing from DeFi. So I, I think we also need to let's say limit until where do we want to take it because otherwise it might be only from from liquidity source until liquidity provision and and that is a long journey and a different expertise also. Right. All right. What I'd like to do now is Miguel. I think that was a fantastic point. Let's just park that thought for a second. I'd like to hand over to the de facto team to actually present to us exactly what you do and how you fit into this puzzle. And then I think we'll go into the problem framing and decide on which of these elements we want to actually tackle today, right? Because we talked about specific parts of the value chain. So over to you, de facto, please. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I will take it while I will give an intro and then you can just complement as as required right so basically uh i will tell you a bit of the story of how we came and we conceptualized the factor so we have been in the in the DeFi space for probably three years now and um we were in the beginning providing trade finance services uh, to companies in, in real need um, and uh, the difference is that instead of using uh, traditional financing we were using uh, liquidity pools in the DeFi space and out of that experience that we have in there, uh, we understood that the way that financial services were provided, um, but we realized quite quickly that in order for scaling these type of opportunities, uh, there's a lot to need to be done, right? And, and, and it's comprehensive because uh, it's understandable, sorry, because the fact is like this, this is fairly new. We have been just talking about DeFi for the last four years or so. So there are a lot of components operationally that still are not up to standard. Like a UI UX is not there. Um, for example, on ramping of ramping of fiat, fiat uh, crypto is, is still a bit, uh, is a bit a hassle. Uh, reconciliations when you are doing transactions uh, and also uh, everything has to do with the regulatory, right? And how you're structuring these financial vehicles to allow investors on one side and asset originators on the other one, right? So what we say is like, look, if we create that that tech layer, right? That is between like uh, these financial structures, right? And people or investors, right? On one side 
And then asset originators like Console Freight that are providing financial services are going to have a really powerful tool that is going to allow uh, using this liquidity in the real world, right? That is what uh, we want. Because we have to we have to probably do this uh, demarcation, right? That is like a DeFi is not just about digital assets, right? What we're doing is bringing real world assets into the DeFi space in order to collateralize them, right? Digitize them and extract liquidity from the DeFi space. So there are two different segments here, right? Digital side is, is way more advanced and is less complex in a way. When you're starting just mixing real world, it's starting to get really tricky and messy, right? So that, that's the piece that we're trying to do. We're, we're trying to build that, that, that pipe, right? That will allow companies, either traditional companies or new companies to plug into that liquidity, right? And um, the idea is just to make it a, as, as a similar experience as possible to what people are used to in the, in the financial space, right? Because if you want to scale these, they need to be comfortable and they need to just be familiar to what they are using and kind of, kind of that's that's what we have behind so but I'm, I'm pretty sure you will have some comments about these and, and from the tech perspective as well something to add yeah so as Alejandro said it, it's about making it easy for traditional businesses to access finance and taking away a lot of the complexity that exists now if you're trying to access DeFi liquidity obviously we're working with companies at the beginning or asset originators who are providing funding for for businesses, but ultimately, you know, you'll be looking at trying to bring in board businesses themselves that have a large, uh, you know, funding need. And the thing with the factor is, what we're looking to do is not only. I mean, we're starting off with invoice financing, but we're looking at other other modes of financing. So inventory financing, you've got purchase order financing, you've got different types of trade finance, but then also you've got things like real estate, etc., that you can you can bring on board as well further down the line. Uh, and then the other part is that you know you'll you'll have this pipeline of assets and asset originators that are in need of finance, but then you've got the ancillary services as well, such as insurance, collections, et cetera. And so what we're trying to do is make it a little bit easier for businesses to access things like parametric insurance. You could got, you can you can actually use other technology as well. So there's blockchain, IoT, you can you can you know, stick IoT devices on containers and and if let's say for a for example, temperature falls below a certain uh, level, you can automatically then trigger insurance claims, et cetera. So the idea here is it, it just goes a little bit beyond financing so that we can allow other service providers to interact with those companies and they can get services that they may, it may take them a little longer to get or they may not be eligible for because they're too small to get that through someone like Defect. All makes sense, thank you. So based on what you've just, um, explain to us and you know your core area that you are focusing on you're directly uh solving for the end customer which is the msme sme etc now the original again going back to to the problem framing um to the left here we talked about liquidity providers being a player do you have any point of view on whether or not within your business model you ever envision you know looking at that segment as well as a b2b provider to these um, lenders at all or do you just want to be cutting across or you know going past them and directly addressing the needs of the end customer so we are looking at we're looking at all aspects of the of the funding chain right so for us it's not just about the asset originators in order you can have as many asset originators as you want but if there's no money on the other side then there's no there's no funding happening right so for us it's all about building both sides of the market the supply and demand right uh, and so we are working with other liquidity providers but also looking at ways in which we can structure things so that the fact it can also be a liquidity provider and there are other things that we're looking at as well that will help um for help increase liquidity within the market for investors let's put it that way so that uh, if you know investors can be tied in for a certain amount of time if they want to liquidate for their positions things we're looking at ways for making it easy for them to do that yeah. so so look, from, from the from the perspective hey, of, of of going directly into a final customer right like uh, as as we see at the moment no because that would bring some for regulatory components right the, the the fact is this right 
if we understand that there are some assets that can be broad, right? And they are like, a, for, because, because we have come across like a lot of assets that are illiquid at the moment, but they have tremendous value. And you could easily be providing liquidity to, to that type of assets, right? So the fact is like, a, if we cannot find an acerinator that is doing it, either we will just empower a company to be doing that, or at some point we probably will need to just take determination if it's the case that we need to just take that type of endeavor ourselves. But as we see it at the moment, no. But if the option and opportunities are there just to, to, to help, maybe something that, that should be considered as well, right? Okay. All right. So I think we've understood this part of the puzzle, right? In terms of what defactor and the area that you're playing in. So going back to the statement that Miguel, you made, right? Um, on the two sides of whether distributor or not, and um, going back to the to the problem framing itself, what part of this value chain should we be trying to focus on right now? So should we be indeed supporting the liquidity provider, or should we just focus on alternative credit financing for the MSMEs? irrespective of whether or not the liquidity providers are a player in that. Because depending on that, our focus will completely change. Yeah, yeah. In, that's, that's correct. But then yeah. kind of sol solve it a moment ago because it, it, it is a double sided business. So you cannot solve one without solving the other. Yeah. So mm -hmm. we need to balance it. We yeah, need to talk about yeah, as I see it, right, DeFi is just is just an enabler, right, for these new opportunities to come, right. So if if you if you think about creating new solutions, but having the same uh, financing or or the same liquidity providers, probably is not going to work either, right? Because they are used to certain expectations of how risk is mitigating, and that was that was going to my point, right? But if you are having DeFi as an enabler for these new solutions to come. Then you have a good mix between both. Right. Also, also, let's say complementing that there is is either if it is possible via technology to diminish the cost per transaction and to achieve the the know your customer and know your transaction level in order to determine the risk. It cannot be only sold by existing financial institutions because they have uh, limits in the in the, in the amount of risk that can allocate in the the portfolio. So there should be other section of liquidity provided that are that are not limited by those limitations again. So one way could be the crowdsourcing aspect or could be via other investors or liquidity providers that don't have those limitations. So it is it is they they, they there, there should be different sources complementary. Yeah, that's, that's a great point there. That's a great point. So if that is the case and we are now focusing on the problem framing board, is it fair to keep it the way we have currently defined it then? And we have then a further distinction in terms of the liquidity providers being either traditional or non-traditional. And the end objective is to still to provide MSMEs easy and affordable access to financing in, in uh, light of the statement that you made that we have to be inclusive so that there is profitability looked after and risk looked after from the lens of the liquidity provider. Any comments or additions, subtractions that we want to make to this statement? You're on mute, Alejandro. Sorry. No, I, think that's, I think that's a good way to frame it. Yeah. You happy with that? OK. Happy what about that. Bairov, Miguel? What do you guys think? Are we happy okay. with that? I put the drop, so I, I, I'm happy <laughs> they, can, they can crush it a little bit and make it better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This is our opportunity to enhance it. So if there's any second yeah. thoughts or additions that we want to make to that, Pierre, any thoughts? Yeah, because I, I mean, as I said, I put it general in order not, not to be exclusive towards any type of uh, liquidity provider, 
and yep. there be a portfolio of liquidity providers supporting uh, a liquidity distributor is what I imagine. I, I, I'm trying to understand what a um, um, decentralized liquidity provider would look like. Could it be uh, like stablecoin um, uh, minter, for example? And in that case, uh, we know that stablecoin have uh, contracts that self-close, right? If there is not enough collateral in it. And I wonder how we would tackle this. Sorry, I just went too far, but I was just trying to see hmm, if it's a stable kind of liquidity provider, is there is some event or life cycle event that we need to manage that we don't usually have in traditional finance. Um, sorry, you asked me, so any my two cents, that's where my brain is right now. I'm trying to understand how we can tackle that. Great question, thank you. Anyone care to um, respond to what? Yes, is? Yeah. I can, I can. Yep. Oh, the suspense is high. <laughs> Mia, are you going to just go for it for a question? <laughs> you're you're on mute. I'm on mute. I was going to start writing, but yes, I can answer verbally, of course. Yeah. So, so risk friendly, risk friendly means in that case um, that uh, let's imagine this. Let's imagine uh, we have I don't know 1,000 MSMEs in. A, in the, in the marketplace or in some sort of portal. However, it is important from a liquidity provider perspective to understand what is the level of risk that they are locating their money. Therefore, it will be very convenient to understand not only the level of risk, but to be able to filter to whom am I able uh, to provide that liquidity. So, so risk friendly means that um, basically connecting the, the right level of risk from a supply and demand perspective. So facilitating that, I think, would be quite important for uh, also connecting the supply and demand of, of financing. <clears throat> okay, I think we need to use mega precision here, yeah, the fact that... And it's frozen. Can, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah no. I you there, so if you could start again, sorry. No, I'm saying like a, that, that we need to use Megan all here. That is not all the sources of liquidity that are coming from the DeFi space are coming from crypto natives. Right. I think that is a, a good clarification because some, I mean, I think it is also very important to consider that, I mean, if let's say we plug, um, let's say the crypto into, into for providing uh, liquidity into a marketplace or in a distributor, most probably the distributor is going to ask uh, for for the specific specifics of where the money is coming from in order to comply probably with regulation at a local level. And speaking about regulation, both payments and crypto are, the, let's say, the two initial steps toward typical fintech regulation in any country. Um, so those two pieces are are there. Yeah, no, definitely. I got to look at the, the fact that there are more and more traditional funds that are coming into the crypto space because they're exploring what DeFi is about and they want to just diversify their portfolios and they're trying to understand why this is better than the traditional systems and so on. So there is a lot of, there is a mix of both, right? And and the idea, right, is just to start bringing more and more of that traditional capital just to play into the DeFi space, especially in the real world assets, because those guys know pretty well how real world assets work. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's the perfect set way to, to start just bringing all that liquidity into the space, right? And yeah, I have some question of people like, yeah, but that's traditional funds. Yeah, but well, you look from that perspective, every single social liquidity in the world coming from the traditional, unless you are completely detached from the fiat system. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it, it is, but but the important component is how this new set of, of, of parameters and technology is allowing us to decentralize and democratize the, 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 the financing and, and, and the potentials that are, Probably that can come out of that, right? All right. So, Miguel, if you can finish your thought on the mural, I'll go back to asking Pierre if you're if you're aligned with what we've discussed and you're happy with the problem statement as we have it now. Any other comments? All good here, I think. Okay. All right, so I think we are all agreeing that this is exactly the problem that we are going to now solve for. So I'm going to jump into the next section here, which is, you know, adding more meat to the bone, as we like to think of it. 
So breaking it down into the two sides of it, the demand and the supply side, uh, we have a description of a potential MSME uh, who has a specific type of problem, which is very representative of what a typical MSME might be uh, experiencing, right? So I'll, I'll, you know, hand over to Miguel, who's drafted this persona, to just quickly, in a few seconds, description, high level, of who the persona is. Yes. Do I have the microphone open? Yes, I have the microphone open. Um, yeah, so this this is a very you know simplistic uh, example in terms of um, I mean most of the of the companies that are not able to receive uh, financing from a traditional uh, source, let's call it a bank or sometimes a um, credit union, is because they don't have a long uh, or reputable operating history and credit worthiness. Um, uh, even though the if the business might be um, let's say uh, profitable. Um, before two years, uh, because of uh, the credit risk assessment and the credit risk process uh, that is has not necessarily been updated for many many years in a financial institution, then they tend to discard uh, those companies that have not been in the in the market for I don't know longer than two years or or even three. That is the first part. Um, so, for example, this kind of company will try to apply. And they are not going to to receive uh, um, uh, the financing required. Now, that is one part of the issue because um, each time a small company um, that usually is the owner or one of the ten com one of the ten or fifty people that is going to to one financial institution, the other the other we're talking about a very complex time consuming process that of course um, is not necessarily um, easy to do and, and in, in terms of uh, several documents uh, they need to understand the rates of, of one the other and the next one and uh, of course this this is quite complicated so from a from a perspective of i need I, I would like to apply to several in order to increase my chances of obtaining financing this is basically um very complicated and and then uh, let's say in in addition the the ones that are um Theoretically, therefore, providing that financing are not so interesting in the segment. So it is a, a non catch game in between the two of them. So, for example, if we see or if we tackle, let's say, down tier from financing to supply chain financing, and we imagine that, let's say, are usually are larger banks or specialized fintechs, the one with the knowledge and the technological capacity to, um, let's say, uh, the, the knowledge to provide supply chain finance products and the technological ability to do that at the scale. So that those are usually large entities that are going for the larger uh, customers, the, the corporates or the large ones. Now, if we think about who is normally servicing the small entities, those are usually small local banks or medium sized banks that are not necessarily the, the experts in supply chain financing, nor the experts in use of technology. So in other words, those those who have the ability are not necessarily focusing that customer segment, and those who don't are usually serving those with not necessarily the best product for doing so. This in, in within the context of, of supply chain financing and, and for example, invoice financing. So yeah, and then also there is the case of, uh, let's say, a large financial institutions with excellent um, supply chain finance platforms. But then the issue is to scale down those platforms so they can service, uh, let's say, at a lower segment. So they already have it, right? But now to down tiering, to down tier those solutions is quite complex from a, from a, um, let's say, technological perspective. Because, let's say, you can have a person in a corporate to use a complex uh, supply chain finance or trade finance solution because the person is specialized doing that. It's a, it's a specific instrument. But then from a UX perspective or user experience perspective, to use that for approaching a, a middle size or a small size company is is, is basically non-scalable. So uh, let's say the adoption of those uh, solutions is, is also based on how easy those are to use. Sorry, just a quick question here. We have a question from Bob Van Kirk who says, does risk friendly include the KYC AML component? 
schedule. We answered this earlier, okay. I think so. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah, but I now, thank you for bringing it back because there was a part missing in that. So one thing is the filtering according to the to the risk, to the level of risk, let's say, and but other thing is also to provide enough information uh, to the to the to the financing suppliers so they can take their decisions and automation based on their existing uh, back office desk. So for example, uh, if if uh, um. A supply financing, uh, a financing supplier can plug with a company, and with with Alejandro, we had we have talked this uh, during the last days. So, with a company that provides uh, chairs, uh, to, that provides uh, information that it supports uh, not your customer, not your transaction, then that will be quite helpful because they basically can plug it, run the the bank uh, risk processes. So, in that from that perspective, is is risk friendly. So the solution needs to be risk friendly if we want to incorporate traditional financing suppliers. Thank you. Thank you for addressing that. Um, yeah. What we would like to do now is on the supply side of things, when we are talking about who we are solving for, we've kind of covered the li liquidity providers more from a traditional perspective. What would be ideal to do is, you know, have a quick brainstorm, uh, if you can time it to maybe a minute, no, no more than that. Uh, on what a non-traditional liquidity provider looks like today. So the green sticky note here is what we'd like to start a quick brainstorm on. So Katrina, I'll hand over to you to run that, please. Yeah, I'll set a timer for one minute. Um, and so if everyone could just double click and add sticky notes on what that description of a non-traditional liquidity provider would be. Um, and I will summon you all here. So we have the timer going. Just think of this as rapid brainstorming. You just need to double click and start typing your answer. So I'll add some blank sticky notes if you want to start to use these. Maybe need to extend a little bit more because some people are still typing. Yep, we'll do another minute. Yep. Um, if you're having trouble adding sticky notes, we have a couple blank ones here that you can just use and click on it and start typing. Great. We'll give everyone a couple seconds just to wrap up what they are writing right now. Um, and then why don't we all take a couple seconds to read what others have have put down here um, and then we can open up to uh, questions and a discussion.
Does anyone have any specific questions on what they're seeing here? Anything to point out, add? I think uh, convenience will be a very important part because um, MSME <coughs> uh, want to be able to access to really pretty people, yes. Um, but we need to really make sure that it's it's transparent and and convenient. I know the risk part is important, but also being able to make sure that it's not convoluted because that's usually the biggest buyer of entry to any kind of design. Yeah, no doubt. And so that needs to be improving the system, right? Like a, a final that you mentioned that. I got that but like one of the things that we're working is is that is that experience on the customer and the experience just making everything easy and making it look like uh is trustworthy and so on. Man, when you see the companies that I need for liquidity, they don't give a toss, funny enough, about any of these things, right? <laughs> and then Definitely for the scalability for component, it needs to be there, right? And, and it's compulsory and we need to work hard on it. But you see like that sense, the need for liquidity is just way above everything. And I was having a chat yesterday with someone and he was saying, look, you talk to a business, right? And you are saying, look, digitize your, your process and just improve your efficiencies, blah, blah, blah. And the guy's just desperate trying to just get liquidity and you say, it's exactly the same as you go into a disadvantaged place somewhere in the world where people barely have food and you are talking about the wonders of the veganism and the sustainability and things like that. Person is going to say, yeah, that sounds fantastic, but I need food. So mm -hmm. I will try to put whatever I get first because that's my need, right? That's, that's, that's my need for survival. That's my imperative uh, intrinsic need. So it's, it's really interesting, right? Yeah, and I think that actually brings us to like the perfect next step of this, right? We've just kind of identified who the, you know, who that we're doing this for, right? This demand side of it and then the supply side. But now this conversation perfectly is going into our next pillar here of what, what are the needs that we're trying to meet? And we were just saying some of them, right? This, you know, it's convenient, it's improving experience, the transparency. Um, I want to open this up to another kind of rapid brainstorm here. So I'm going to set the timer for two two minutes um, and summon you to this section and let's start thinking about what are those needs as we just started to do right now. So the timer is set and remember just double click and then start typing to add your sticky notes. And I've added a couple blank ones below too, if that's helpful to just click on them and start typing.
All right, that is time. Um, we'll give everyone a couple more seconds to finish their thoughts. Um, but as we do that, please read what others have written and um, then we'll open it up to questions and a discussion. I have a question. So someone's written uh, in terms of the need of the particular persona that we're talking about here is MSME. Do they really care where the money is coming from? Uh, especially to this point here that says unlock liquidity in DeFi, fi in DeFi space. That's if, is there a specific... Uh, do yeah, they go to that? No, they don't. They don't from, uh, this is from our experience servicing customers in cost of freight. They don't care. They don't, Look, th there is there, there is a point that if we don't tell them that the money is coming from crypto, they wouldn't even realize where the money is coming from, right? Because for them, the experience is just completely the same as they are used to. Right. So in that sense, like I think unless that th there is something that is not complying with regulations or components like that, the customers realistically, they wouldn't yeah. even care. Uh, and right. the, important, the, the important component out of that is when when these customers uh, are realizing about the benefits, right, and, and realizing about the fact that DeFi is just giving them this opportunity, you 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 have a straight away over there, a new believer, right, in 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 this technology, and and that's extremely powerful. That's extremely powerful because you will have someone that is just preaching that, uh, you know, preaching the gospel, if you want to call it. But uh, it, it is it is powerful that that word of mouth, especially in the SMEs, is extremely valuable. Right. Yeah, that was the only thing that stood out to me. But otherwise, yeah, I mean, it's all quite common sense. They are all looking for the easiest, quickest way to access cash uh, without hassle, as someone has said. Uh, and really important point is affordable. They don't want to pay high interest rates as well in accessing cash. Yeah. And yeah. transparency, right? Like not only affordable, but you know yeah. uh, all the fees in advance, which okay. could be a bit tricky in crypto, right? Oh, Especially right. if like, hey, I'm going to lend you USDC, but in reality, you can really use them as USDC, and there might be some gas fee associated depending on the chain they're living on. Yeah, yeah I think that's a pretty really good point. The gas that's fee. One of the things, yeah, that's one of the things that, that you will see, seeing like a, at the moment, most of the liquidity is in Ethereum. And we know that and sometimes Ethereum can be extremely expensive. But yeah. when you start seeing the what is the, the worst of the evils, and it's either you don't have liquidity or you pay three hundred dollars to obtain that liquidity. Yeah. So <laughs> you put things in the balance, right? It can be, but but let's 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 think about uh, that in the future there are going to be more and more chains offering this type of liquidity. We're exploring some other uh, protocols at the moment that they will have way lower fees and that will have their own liquidity as well. So yeah. the idea is just to have or interconnect all these different liquidity pools across the whole like blockchain ecosystem and just allow people to, one from the investors, just look for something that fits better hit or like their risk profile, but also for the customers and the aggregators just to see where they fit better as an aggregator, right? Because as I say, every single one of those investors have a different risk profile and we're going to be able just to match those two or you have a better fit and probably a longer uh, relationship in there. Yeah, and Alejandro, I think this perfectly aligns now again to our next section of now thinking about, like you were saying, you were kind of solutioning a little bit, like what would those other kind of, well, if we're using different chains or or how this is going to work. So I want to um, move us to this next section now that we've talked about, like, what are those needs? Um, sorry, Shane, I'm sorry to interrupt. There is one thing that we'd like to do in addition to the solutioning, which is um, the bottom half of the supply side, right? So here we've talked about the need of the MSME, but since we're also solving for the liquidity provider, whether traditional or non-traditional. Let's also think about the needs from their perspective. What do you say? Sure. Yeah? yeah why don't we 
maybe a one minute rapid brainstorm on the liquidity side, since I think we are kind of focusing more in this MSME space. Um, so we can do that here and I'm going to set the timer for one minute. I think everyone has wrapped up their answers. I don't see anyone else typing. So why don't we again take some time to review what people wrote down and then we'll ask any questions if anyone has any. <coughs> Um, I would say that maybe this dashboard of money flow, I'm seeing more as a when versus a need. So maybe that will be our first one over in this next section. Yeah, I agree. Sorry, that's mine. That's okay. I like um, the step ahead. I like people thinking next step ahead. <laughs> I wonder if the low rate of default dilution is on the liquidity side. I mean, yes, I guess it is, but I wonder how you can. Anyway, yeah, stop solution. Wait one minute and then we'll get to that. Yeah. Any other comments before we move forward? I think it's quite straightforward what we've all written and we all seem to be quite aligned. Um, Sahini, actually, I'm thinking maybe instead of going into the when, maybe we go straight into solutioning since we've already kind of started to get to this round. What are you thinking? Um, yeah, we don't have a specific, you know, lens. Like we, we, we're not putting ourselves in the shoes of either a bank or any one specific persona type. So we we really don't know what a good solution could look like. However, I think we can agree on specific things that a solution should cover for right. it to be a viable solution. So let's think it think about it from that lens. Because if we go back to the um, original statement, we we said liquidity providers need to do this for the MSMEs so that they can serve the segment in a profitable and risk-friendly manner. So profitability and risk-friendly risk assessment, those elements are highly, highly critical for the solution to be a viable solution, right? And then, so that's from the lens of the liquidity provider from an institutional perspective. What about from the lens of an individual perspective, they were players in the market as well. Um, and similarly, what are the needs from a desirability perspective from the lens of the MSME who are actually accessing that financing? So I think it's still worth doing just to set some criteria to define what good looks like. All right, <laughs> so then let's jump into the when um, of like what these types of, I think this is gonna turn into solutioning. That's why I was kind of moving towards maybe we can think about solutioning within this pillar, right? So um, I will summon you all to this next section of when. Um, so thinking about like that functionality and what that in essence looks like or what it needs to have. 
So yeah. again, kind of overlap. So I think we can maybe think of this as when and what it looks like in this section. And, so um, I'm set so these two sides of so the supplier and the, dem the demand side, so lender side and the borrower side, please. Yep. And I'm going to start the timer for three minutes since we're going to do both the lender and the borrower. There's a question which we can get to shortly after this brainstorm. All right, we have 20 ish more seconds to wrap these up. If anyone has any final thoughts on when we would have successfully solved this problem, so what that needs, maybe what those functions are. Um, and if you've finished, oh, time is up, so now we can review them. Um, and please, if anyone has any questions or comments, Let's discuss now and then we'll move on to the when side of the uh, liquidity provider lens, the supply side lens. Any questions, comments before we move to the next section? I can I can address the question that was yep. made by, yeah, by Shaq. So it depends on the context. So let me give you some examples. One of the one the, the first example will be through arbitration. So for example, um, let's say uh, local chambers of commerce and and similar entities in the country provide arbitration services or dispute resolution services and those can be uh, those systems can be used for supporting uh, this type of marketplaces that would be one um, and i'm talking and those are already used by traditional uh, financing suppliers for in, in many of their disputes mm, the other one could be um, uh, basically to plug insurance as part of the ecosystem in order to ensure uh, the different transactions of it 
this is is um, let's say is already part of the uh, traditional trade finance um, let's say uh, ecosystem the 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 insurance aspect and what is important to take into account is that uh, that insurance needs to um, let's say um, needs to have until a certain amount of impact in the profitability of the operation because if it is let's say to ensure basically the operation most probably is not going to be profitable so let's say insurance will be the solution now how to equilibrate it is a is a different task maybe alejandro well, would you like to complement there yeah i would like to add something right and there's something that, that is, is being explored right now in the DeFi space but yeah as, as you say like a, 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 there are great ways to just mitigate the risk and if there are defaults and so on we will be just going against against that that insurance or even if you are collateralizing the cargo you you can just liquidate cargo and uh, components like that and then if it's further than that well you need to just go into court and this is where things get really ugly but I, I think that the one of the components that people are starting to explore in the DeFi space is about the redistribution of risk across the whole ecosystem right that is a really interesting point because what happens right now in the financial ecosystem is that not everybody has a skin in the game and that allows people just to gamble a little bit in order for them to just take better benefit out of this whole, the whole system so if you kind of change that perspective and everybody that is involved into it has a skin in the game that what is going to potentially do is um enable uh, just building a track record that is visible for everybody, but also it's going to just provide a lot of rewards to the uh, great good actors in the ecosystem. And the ones that are not doing that well and they are considered as bad actors, probably they are going to be just um, be, how to say, uh, it's not punish, but they, they clearly uh, will have some consequences, right, out of it. So I think that's 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 a, a, an important component that needs to be that needs to be explored, uh, and that probably will end up having a great impact on, on making the system be fairer for everybody. I think it is a great point because if we're I mean, since these are basically network-based business, the 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 risk of this of default could be redistributed within the network. Uh, therefore, basically incentivizing the the non-default of, let's say, throughout the network, that could be a, an interesting one to to handle. All right. So if we are all aligned, uh, let's go into the final exercise, which is finally the solutioning. I'm sure we've all had uh, a lot of ideas pop up in our heads while we're talking. So. This is where we start to actually address them. So over to Katrina, how long do you think we have? Yeah, I'm um, I'm summoning you all to this next section and putting down a couple just sticky notes um, so we can think about, um, you know, as you solution those types of personas that we were just going through so we can have those there thinking about them. Um, I'm going to set the timer for... Let's see, how about three minutes? And then we can have two minutes to discuss and wrap up um, at the half hour. So I'm going to set the timer now. And please start thinking about what those solutions would really look like. And as uh, as you solution and do this, all right, I just want to remind us of some of those comments that we were talking about needing to be, um, you know, quite transparent, both on the side of the demand side and the supply side. Transparency, um, maybe low cost, um, faster, quick and more affordable. Thinking about those key ideas as we solution.
I'm going to add a couple sticky notes too, so anyone can grab these and start writing them down. So please feel free to grab any of those blank sticky notes and just start typing away. Right. Give everyone a couple seconds to put down their last thoughts. And then um, please take a moment to review what everyone else has written. And um, we can have some time for any last questions or comments. <laughs> Does anyone have any comments or questions after reviewing? Should, the, should the, <clears throat> the liquidity provider be only DeFi liquidity or should we just make it like it could be traditional and DeFi and it doesn't really matter where the source as long as there is a way to provide, meaning that it could be modern like, like crowd and DeFi and traditional banking and how can we make it simple? Um, mm -hmm. That's kind of my question. Uh, that's, a, that's a good point, and I, I think I think look from the DeFi point of view, as I said, like DeFi is just is just all that set of of technology and parameters that are allowing that uh, this intermediation of either investment and uh, financial services, right? So from that point, if you go in in that in that perspective, like the money that is coming and is feeding that that uh, financial structure. At the end of the day, it's going to just provide benefit on the other side. So realistically, from my point, it doesn't matter. Like, and if we want to just increase the volume that is that locked at the moment in DeFi, clearly we need we need more traditional investors to start understanding how it works, why this is the future, and why it will be beneficial for the interesting just stepping into it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I... Yeah, even like honestly, I, I know this app that was, I think it was in Mexico where you could invest, but what you would do, you would invest in business, right? So again, the thing is trade finance is different because you'd be asking money to be able to pay your supplier and so on, and there is kind of investing in business because I need, I don't know, to buy a new coffee machine or whatever. Um, I think maybe we need to break this into what kind of liquidity is required or not. I'm not sure. I just feel like these things are two different instruments yeah. in, the, in the banking space, but not maybe in the crowdfunding space. So I will give you an example, right? Of what is happening, let's say with console freight. So console freight, that is one of, is the first accelerator for the factor, uh, like has a pool in, in centrifuge, right? And these investors are coming and they're investing in this pool of liquidity that is managed by, by console freight and console freight at the same time is just providing trade uh, trade finance services into these companies, right? So the investor is coming and he's saying, console freight, I like the project actually. What are they doing? They're doing trade finance. Okay, fine, real world assets. I understand them really well. How they mitigating risk this way? And I say, okay, great. I'm going to commit $10,000.
So even though by proxy, uh, sorry, even though directly these guys or oh, the investors are not putting money into the end customer, by proxy they are doing it, right? Because those funds are going to end up in someone, right? That had gone through all the due diligence set up by this asserinator, right? So it, it, it works as well. Just, just going back to, to your point. It, it, it yeah, yeah. That's one way of doing it. I wonder also if it's like, I want to put $10. Like I have like a thousand people who want to put $10. Yeah. I'm thinking about like almost Bernie Sanders uh, campaign funding, right? But like everybody wants to put $10 and then you could just have like these companies that need $50,000 can have like tons of people that put $10. That you, you're right, you need transparency and risk to be clear. And that's the part that's not really clear. Isn't it? I, think, I think the point Pierre was touching is, is also in regards of, I mean, to make the, the division in between is financing based on equity or is financing based on debt? Um, and, and that is where the, the cut is, because equity equity based financing is also growing um, via fintech as well as as the finance one. And then, I mean, if, if we're talking, for example, about supply chain finance, one is not necessarily debt because what we're using is, um, let's say we're, we're financing, um, say we're, we're we're modifying the timing that they're receiving the. The, the money against the asset, but not necessarily debt per se in, in the in the case of invoice financing. So it's not even debt. Doesn't affect the books. Yeah. Yeah, that but the problem layers of credit do. Yeah, letter of credit, yes. But for example, invoice financing, no. Yeah, invoice financing, no. But like it that's that's kind of the only one. The only ones all, all they go is against the books, right? Mm -hmm. So that's 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 the component like that is really to discussing yesterday, Miguel, that is the collateralization of assets, because if you are collateralizing those assets, then that's fresh liquidity, right? Because you're making liquid these assets that are trapped, meaning that that doesn't go against the books. It's fresh liquidity. Exactly. You're, you're basically consumer. unlocking trapped capital. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if there aren't any more questions or comments, um, I want to just thank everyone for participating and having such a great discussion today. I think we really delve into this in a great way and started to kind of figure out what this looks like and what it would be. Um, so with that, thank you again. And um, for the hackers on the call, this mural board will live on. So be sure to save this link and then you can click back into it and review some of those ideas that we went over as you start creating your hackathon project. Um, and we really hope this has helped spark some ideas. Any other closing comments, Haney? Not really, it was really fun. Uh, it was great to meet you both. And um, I don't know if there's any other comments or any concerns that we've had uh, so far that we haven't addressed yet. Any last comments from anyone? No, it's okay. I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I, will, I will just say as, as yesterday a little bit that, um, let's say at Finastro, we understand that most of the innovation happens out of the house and that uh, we hope these, these sessions actually is for uh, the imagination of new solutions that we, of course, have not even thought about and probably can, uh, let's say, help uh, to tackle this problem that we are for sure not going to tackle alone and, and I we don't think anyone in particular it will do but it's going to be different set of solutions as usual uh, approaching and tackling this problem definitely that's a perfect way of ending well thank you everyone it was really good to be here and I uh, hope you have a fantastic rest of the day thank you nice. thank you bye bye, bye. bye. bye.